Hello, cruel world. Charles Bronson is probably Britain's most notorious prisoner. He was convicted of armed robbery in 1974. He, he was sentenced to seven years in prison, but this actually escalated to him spending 40 years in prison altogether. He was known for his prolific violence and he spent a bit of time in Broadmoor Hospital. So what were the motivations for his violence? What were his psychiatric diagnoses? Can violence be cured in Broadmoor? And what's the difference between Broadmoor and a prison? I'm gonna answer all of these questions within this video. So this is part of a series of around six or seven real life patients from Broadmoor. I'm going to give you my professional insights and my theories as a forensic psychiatrist. So I actually worked in Broadmoor Hospital myself as a middle grade psychiatrist around seven years ago. So I've already done a series on Robert Maudsley, who's a man who killed four people, including one actually in Broadmoor. And then I've done an episode on Roddy Cray, who was like a celebrity gangster who had schizophrenia. And he was actually mates with uh, Bronson at Broadmoor. And also David Copeland, who set off, a set, uh, set off three nail bombs in London in 1999. I've also done an episode on Napper, who is a serial murderer and rape, rapist who's diagnosed with schizophrenia and Asperger's. So go check out those videos in case you're interested. So firstly, Bronson, let's talk about his background and then we'll talk about his violence. And then after all that, I'm gonna do what I think is my USP, which is I'm gonna give you my own psychodynamic formulation about Charles Bronson. So sit back with your favorite shiv and let's get started. So Charles Bronson, he was actually born Michael Gordon Peterson on the 6th of December, 1952. So he shares the same birthday as Babyface Nelson, who's like this infamous robber from the early 1900s, and Jud Jud Apatow, film director, and Freddie Flintoff, who used to be captain of the English cricket team and then weirdly attempted to be a boxer for some reason. So he changed his name to Charles Bronson because that was the name of a big action star at that moment, which is kind of the equivalent of you changing your name to The Rock. He changed his name more times than P. Diddy, uh, AKA Puff Daddy, AKA Puffy, although I think he missed a trick and he should have called himself Coco Puff. So later, Charles Bronson changed his name to Charles Salvador, which was like a nod of respect to the surrealist painter Salvador Dali. If you've not seen any of Salvador Dali's work, it's kind of like the paintings that you would do after you've taken magic mushrooms. Charles Bronson was apparently quite mild-mannered mild as a child. In his early teens, he was in gangs and he was involved in a number of robberies and by all reports he enjoyed fighting from a very early age as well as being uh, involved in lots of petty crime. Bronson's actually quite a successful author so he's written loads of books about his own experience and he was a fitness fanatic so he spent many years in solitary confinement and in fact he even wrote an entire book dedicated to like how to work out how to exercise in confined spaces. So he's kind of like Joe Wicks if Joe Wicks went through a gritty reboot. So Bronson went to Broadmoor in December 1978, by which time I would have only been a few weeks old. So yeah, I'm older than I look. And there are only three high secure hospitals in England and they're reserved for the most extremely dangerous mentally disordered offenders. And they are Broadmoor, <clears throat> which is in, in the south of England, Ashworth near Liverpool and Rampton, which is in Nottinghamshire. And interestingly, Broadmoor actually was transferred to all three of them at some point in his prison career. Uh, the fourth high secure hospital in the UK is in Scotland, it's called Carstairs. I actually visited there when I was a medical student many, many years ago. So during his imprisonment, Bronson really struggled to get on with other inmates. So he attempted to strangle a child sex murderer and he was stopped seconds away from killing this man. As I mentioned before, Br uh, Bronson was friends with Ronnie Cray in Broadmoor. And in 1982, Bronson did this rooftop protest. So he escaped the confines of Broadmoor, got onto the roof and he started ripping off the tiles, throwing them off. And he caused around a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage. And shortly after that, he went on hunger strike and that's when he was transferred to Ashworth Hospital. I wonder if, they, if he was simply transferred because they just couldn't handle him. I've got a question for you, dear viewers, which is, can you guess how many days Charles Bronson went without eating? I'll tell you later on in this episode and I'll give you props if you get within two days. So Bronson had hundreds of unsavory incidents, literally a litany, including repeated violence, fighting, taking hostages. 
I can't take about, uh, talk about them all in this video because it would literally be two hours long. But I will tell you about one of my favorites. So in 1996, when Bronson was in Belmarsh prison, he took a, he just, he'd just taken a prison doctor hostage in Birmingham prison, then was transferred. And he kidnapped an Iraqi hijacker who bumped into him in the canteen and he felt disrespected. So what Bronson did is he kidnapped this person and he also took two of his friends hostage as well. So my advice dear viewers, if you ever find yourself in a penitentiary and you're in the canteen and if somebody bumps into you, you kind of have to stand up for yourself because you don't want everyone to think you're a punk. But at the same time, I wouldn't recommend taking hostages. I think it's taking it a bit far. But anyway, during the hostage taking incident, Bronson had what appeared to be issues with his mental health. So he was ranting about his dead father. He forced the Iraqis to tickle his feet and to call him the general. And he also demanded <clears throat> a plane to Libya and two Uzis. And he reportedly started chanting, I want ice cream, I want ice cream. To be honest, I think, in my opinion, he was a bit too ambitious with his demands. The guy didn't even get an ice cream. And because he felt guilty about hitting one of the hostages with a metal tray, Bronson then insisted that that man got a metal tray and hit him four times. And on top of all of that, Bronson slashed himself with a razor, then he released the hostages, and then he went to the segregation unit. And five years were added to his sentence for that one incident. Uh, that is reflective on all the craziness that he did while he was locked up. In 2008, Bronson claimed he could do 172 press-ups in 60 seconds and 94 sit-ups in 30 seconds, which is pretty impressive. So what is my psychological assessment of Bronson and why did he commit so much violence? Well, I think Charles Bronson is unusual because he just loved a punch-up. He was convicted of an armed robbery in 1974 and he was sentenced to seven years in prison. So actually that level of violence isn't that serious for the average prisoner or for the average uh, patient in Broadmoor Hospital because by definition to get into high secure you have to be extremely deadly. But because of his repeated violence whilst he was locked up, this escalated, as I said, ended up being 40 years in prison, which is pretty insane. So Bronson would keep getting punished for his violence and he would keep having uh, years added on to his detention or his prison sentence. He would also damage prison property, take hostages, have fights and confrontations with the guard. In that entire time period, Bronson spent one 69 day stint outside of being detained. And during that time, he reassessed his life and he became a Zen Buddhist. Uh, no, only kidding, he became a bare knuckle boxer. And within that time, he was arrested for robbing a jewelry store and went back to prison. So obviously he just has this propensity for violence. So violence is usually classified as either instrumental, and that means it's explicit and it's kind of linked to future goals. So they might be to acquire money or possessions if you're robbing somebody, or to improve your social position, say as the hard man of the estate or in your gang, or it can be expressive which is unplanned acts of anger or rage or frustration. So in my opinion, Bronson was actually both of those things. And additionally, I think he actually enjoyed regular violence, not just as a release of anger, but almost as a lifestyle. So what I'm saying is it wasn't like a means to get his goal, but it was actually the goal itself just because he, he committed it so often all the time and seemed to be enjoying it. So what about Bronson's mental health? Well, apparently there was a bit of confusion about his diagnosis. So some doctors thought he had psychopathy, he was a psychopath, and he was also diagnosed with schizophrenia, but there was no clear agreement. And I think the very fact that he was in and out of high secure hospital, went to prison in between, suggests that his mental illness was very variable and fluctuating because generally if you've got a clear mental illness, you stay within hospital. And also my personal opinion is that some of his odd behavior, so to give you an example, when he forced the Iraqis to tickle his feet and to call him the general, to me that seems more akin to attention seeking and not true psychosis. Because a true psychosis is like hearing voices or having a one particular or a few particular fixed ideas usually like paranoid and they're fairly basic, they're not complex ideas generally, uh, which doesn't really fit in with his behavior. I do think that Bronson probably was a psychopath. If you wanna know more about psychopaths, go and check out my video series. I talk about this in detail. But briefly, psychopathy is a bit like the older brother of antisocial personality disorder. So it's got all of the features of antisocial personality disorder, which are not, not knowing right from wrong, not caring about the rights uh, of others and lacking empathy, 
lacking remorse and being and lying a lot but with psychopathy it's more than that it's also being ultra manipulative and charming and if you see Bronson in any of his interviews he is definitely a charming man psychopaths see everybody around them as an opportunity to exploit even close friends and family so they have egotistical traits everything revolves around them they only care about themselves and I think what Bronson did with his violence was uh, very attention seeking it's very narcissistic so back to my question before how long do you think the hunger strike that Bronson had in Ashworth was. Drum roll, please. It was 18 days. So how did you do? Did you get anywhere near that? Did you get within two days? Let me know in the comments below. And I have to say 18 days without eating food to me is massively impressive. I do intermittent fasting, which means that I'm starving almost every single day until noon. No way I could carry it out for that long. So what was Bronson's actual motivation for his violence? I already said it was for attention. So I think it was to uphold his image because his repeated violence got him from being a nobody to being really notorious. Uh, he was a celebrity, he was friends with Ronnie Cray in Broadmoor who was also a celebrity gangster. And they made a film about Bronson with Tom Hardy, which is just another way of indicating that he loved this attention. Tom Hardy, I think, is a brilliant actor. However, he has committed a cardinal sin in my view, which is this. He was in the DC universe as Batman's Bane and also in the Marvel universe as Venom. In my humble opinion, you can't do both. To me, that's like supporting Arsenal and Tottenham or claiming to rep the Crips and the Bloods. It just ain't cool, man. Incidentally, Hardy actually became mates with Bronson during filming. Uh, I imagine Charles Bronson's probably quite an interesting friend to have. Bronson's notoriety and his attention even got him married whilst he was in prison. So to me, this is even more impressive than an 18-day strike or doing 172 press-ups in 60 seconds, or 94 sit-ups in 30 seconds. So women would read articles about him, they would write to him, and I don't think any of that would have happened without his notoriety. Hello, Cruel World. I'm just interrupting my own broadcast to share with you some exciting news, which is that I'm gonna be featured on a documentary this Wednesday, 26th of May, at 9 p.m. on Channel 5. It's called Broadmoor Serial Killers and High Security. So I'll be talking about a range of very high profile Broadmoor cases, including some of the ones that I've actually made videos on. And I'll be talking a little bit about my time of working in Broadmoor, which I did about seven years ago as a middle grade psychiatrist. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please, please, please check out my documentary on Channel 5. Um, it should be available on Catch Up TV as far as I'm aware, so go peep it if you missed the original, it's not a problem. Okay, nice to speak to you, and remember, stay euthymic and I love you. So the next question is, can you cure violence in Broadmoor? So I've already spoken about how you react to violence in Broadmoor on a previous video about Robert Maudsley, go check that out. But briefly, all forensic psychiatric units, especially high secure, are, are, are geared up to deal with violence. When I worked in Broadmoor in one of the uh, intensive care wards, we would have people in long-term seclusion. So they would be locked up for most of the day and let out for a short period because they were so violent, which is very different to most hospitals. It happens in prison, but in hospitals generally, they're there for rehabilitation, so this is unusual. And also you can give them sedatives at that time to try and calm them down. But I'm asking a different question, which is how do you cure violence? How do you stop people from being violent in the future, not just at that moment? And the answer to that from a forensic psychiatrist's point of view is it depends on what's causing the violence. So if it's psychosis, like say if Bronson was hearing voices telling him to beat people up, or if he was having paranoid delusions telling him that he had to beat certain people up preemptively, then you treat the psychosis with antipsychotic medications. However, it's, it's related to his personality or a personality disorder, and it can and often is both, then it's a much harder thing to try and fix because it's actually somebody's personality. And the way that you do that is you help them understand their violence through psychotherapy. And this is difficult because it can take years to build up trust and years to build a relationship. And you help them reflect on how violence has ruined their life, how it's hurt other people, how it's caused them to be locked up. Although arguably you could say that this might not work very well on Bronson because violence was part of his notoriety, part of his excitement. And then you also convince people to engage in other forms of rehabilitation, occupational therapy, which might involve them having life skills or education. So when they finally leave hospital, they've got another way of making money that's not violent, that's not robberies. So I hope that clears that up. Okay, I'm about to tell you soon what's coming up on a site for sore minds, but first I just wanna give a quick shout out to Joshua Miles. 
He is a true crime YouTuber. He has lots of fascinating videos and he goes into them on forensic detail. So I'm just gonna briefly tell you about what's coming up on the next episode of A Sight for Soul Minds. Um, but before that, I just introduce you to this channel. I discuss a whole range of mental health topics, some to do with offending and some to do with more uh, common psychiatric disorders. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist, so I assess mentally disordered offenders or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. I work in courts and in prisons and in secure psychiatric units. So just before I tell you about what's coming up soon, I just want to again reiterate that I'm going to be a speaker at CrimeCon UK, which is this huge true crime convention, really big in the States, coming over to London uh, for the first time ever. It's going to be in September. You can hear about serial killers, unsolved crimes and you can hear from criminologists, law enforcement agents and you will have some uh, sit down time with your favourite podcasters. I'm going to be doing a talk and I'm going to be telling you about two real life cases that I've assessed of people who have killed their own family members. One was mentally ill, they went down the criminal, uh, went down the hospital route and one was not so they went down the criminal justice route. If you're a true crime enthusiast you cannot miss out on this big event. Use the link below to get your tickets and use the code PSYCH for 10% off because I've got your back. So I'm almost coming to the end of my series about Broadmoor patients. I've already done a video on Robert Maudsley, an English serial killer, Rodney Cray, celebrity gangster with schizophrenia, David Copeland, who set off three nail bombs in London in 1999, and Robert Knapper, who is a prolific sex offender, and he murdered innocent women in front of their children if you want to go check out about their stories, but I also tell you a little bit about the life of, and the life inside high secure hospitals like Broadmoor. And my next video is going to be on Kenneth Erskine, who you might not know of by name, but he is the Stockwell Strangler. In each episode, I'm going to give you my personal insights and I'm going to use my professional experience. Uh, and also coming up in the series is Daniel Gonzalez, who's a spree killer who murdered four and injured two people in September 2004 when he was aged 24. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 18. So that's just a little taste of what is coming up. So to conclude my thoughts on the case of Charles Bronson overall, I think he's a very fascinating man. He's obviously entertaining. He's charming in interviews. The things that he do that he's done are so wild that they're fascinating to hear about. But I think there's also a bit of a sadness to his tale. So he's a man who's 68 years old now. It sounds like it's very unlikely he's ever gonna change his ways. And I think there's, there's something a bit tragic that you've got a guy who has possibly got all this wit and charisma and charm and he's spending almost all of his life locked up. The very fact that he struggled for that 69 day stint to stay out of prison, to stay out of trouble, to stay away from violence, suggests to me that it's kind of, it's so inbuilt and systemic in him that um, it's sad to see that it might not ever go away. My other thoughts are that his mental health is obviously complicated. As I said before, jumping in between so many high secure units, between them and prison and back again, suggests that his mental health not only is hard to diagnose, but it's also hard to stabilize and treat. All that remains is for me to beg to you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Not only does it help me out immensely, but it actually slows down global warming. Been getting loads of comments recently and it's been a pleasure to chat to you guys. You can email me directly or you can hit me up on social media. You can like our Facebook page, see me on Instagram, etc. etc. If you've got any questions or ideas, email me directly on psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. Please tell your favourite people about Psych for Sore Minds because they deserve it. Spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic and please do not forget.